We're back on the floor of the Florida House of Representatives with Speaker Will Weatherford and Senate President Don Gates. Uh, Mr. President, didn't give you a chance to talk much about what's important to you in terms of reform of higher education. I want to make sure that when our children and grandchildren walk across the stage and get a college or university diploma, that it's a passport to a real job in the real economy. Now, President Obama and uh, Governor Romney both acknowledged during the campaign that about half of last year's college and university graduating class in this country is unemployed or is underemployed, meaning their degree really didn't qualify them for a job. In Florida, we have an opportunity, I think, to lash higher education to the realities and the opportunities in the economy by incentive funding uh, so that colleges and universities will see that it is in their interests to make sure that they're offering degree programs and offering those degree programs embedded with skills so students can be competitive in the economy and also make sure that parents and students know before they go so that they will know and we'll be doing this through a website that'll be up in uh, in a few weeks and that is if you have this vocational or professional or occupational interest and you go to that Florida college or university here's your chance of getting a job with that degree and here's how much money you'll make we have that data available we haven't shared it with the public we need to share it with the public so that people can make wise higher education decisions mr. speaker all across the country state legislatures are looking at the issue of pension reform for public employees. I know that's something that's being looked at in your plan with the uh, Senate president. What are you looking at? What are you uh, thinking of filing in terms of legislation that will deal with pension reform? Well, first, uh, what's an important thing that I think that people have to know is that when you look across the country, the states that are raising taxes on their citizens, they're not raising taxes to fund education, although that may be what they're selling. They're not raising taxes to fund health care. They're raising taxes to bail out busted pension systems. And I think we have an opportunity in Florida to take that threat of that tax increase on a small business or on a single mother off the table by being doing the responsible thing and transitioning our, our pension system from a defined benefit plan to a defined contribution plan. Now, what we're just, talking about- Just in, for our viewers, defined benefit Versus yeah. Defined contribution. <clears throat> yeah, what that means is currently most state employees, they pay into a retirement and they are guaranteed an outcome forever, which means that, you know, when you, if you retire at age 50, you're going to get a certain amount of money every month until, you know, until the moment you die, mm -hmm. no matter what, no matter how long you live or whatever. Uh, a defined contribution is like a 401k. That's what 90% of Americans have. And for some reason, we have this double standard for state workers. And I believe that everybody should be in what is called a defined contribution, which is a 401k type plan. And it prevents us from having a broken system in our pension plan. And um, you know, to me, uh, it's controversial, but it shouldn't be because we're not talking about changing uh, any rules or regulations for existing employees. If you are an existing employee with the state of Florida and you're in a, what is called a defined benefit plan, you will stay there. But for all new employees, starting January 1st, 2014, we would move you into a defined contribution plan, which is a 401k. Mr. President, you've uh, called for more transparency and standardization of accounting standards and recording requirements uh, uh, across the board for local public sector plans. Break that down for us and tell us why that's important. Well, here's why it's important. It's important because what the speaker said about the predictability of, of our uh, liabilities as taxpayers and the surety that uh, employees will have a pension to rely upon that's honestly funded goes to the local level as well. The Collins Center, uh, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan group, recently put out a report saying that in our local municipal and county pension plans, only uh, about 30% of, uh, of the dollars that are necessary uh, for the uh, municipal plans are actually being contributed and only about 40 percent at the county level leaving us with about a 10 billion dollar unfunded deficit liability in local pension plans that's our firefighters our policemen that's people who provide our city services and our county services who think there's going to be a pension for them 
we need to make sure that we strengthen our pension programs in the way the speaker is talking about so that there's really a retirement for them. So we think that there ought to be public disclosure of where those pension programs are. There ought to be a standard of solvency that's a national standard applied to our local pension plans. And we think that the people who are responsible ultimately for funding them ought to know where they are so that they can bring the appropriate kind of persuasion to bear on local officials to do what the speaker and I want to do at the state level, and that's make sure that our retirement benefits for our employees are secure and honestly reported. So what you're saying, if I hear you correctly, is that there are a lot of unknowns about what are in some of those funds right now. There are a lot of unknowns, and but the one known is that we're underfunding the defined benefit plans at the state level and at the local level, and that's really writing a check that we don't have funds to cover, and people who are out there serving our community and our state are counting on a retirement that they might not get. And the only bailout that's happening in these other big states, as the speaker mentioned, was to raise taxes to fund those pensions. We don't want to do that to the taxpayers. We sure don't want to do that to municipal and county and state workers. That's one I haven't heard. I don't know if the state employees have heard that either. But uh, let's move on to another su subject. Uh, during the election, once again, Mr. Speaker, uh, there were media accounts of long lines coming out of uh, election polling places uh, in the state, many of them in South Florida. Uh, and you both have decided to include reviewing the election laws uh, from this standpoint, uh, what needs to be done to improve the voting process in Florida. Why did you decide, among all the things you could be looking at, that you were going to look at this again? Well, not, not to sound like a broken record, but um, trust in government, again, is, is, a, is a problem, not just at the federal level, but at the state level. And I'm not here to place blame on anybody particularly. I think there's enough of that to go around. But what we all know and can agree upon is that our elections process was flawed. Nobody should have to wait six hours in line to vote at early voting. Uh, nobody should have to wait till five or six days after the election to figure out where the electoral votes are going to go to the Republican or the Democratic nominee. Um, and we have an obligation, I believe, as the state who sets the election laws to make sure that they're functional, to make sure that people can vote timely, and to make sure that everyone understands what the rules are. And uh, I believe that, you know, instead of running from this issue and blaming, you know, anybody else, the Senate President and I decided we're going to take this on head on and we're gonna to talk to our supervisors and we're gonna work with our Secretary of State and we're gonna work with Republicans and Democrats to try to come up with a bipartisan solution to make sure that this never happens again. And um, I think some folks wanna focus on the past of how we got here. Mm -hmm. The Senate President and I wanna focus on the future and how we make sure it never happens again. So you're gonna, the word I heard there was bipartisan. You're not gonna take an approach where one blames the other or whatever you're gonna to try to say. How can well, we? Well, yeah, and if I could, you know, bipartisans, bipartisanship's a two-way street. And so we're going to do our best to, to make the options bipartisan. We want to work with both parties. But at the end of the day, they've got to work with us, too. Okay. Yeah, and I think that uh, election law reform has to be to create accuracy and fairness and uh, timely counts, not to create a partisan advantage for one party or the other or to work out a grudge about something that might have happened in the past. Instead, we've got to have elections laws and elections in Florida that are a model for this country. And that's our goal. All right. Let's depart for, from your joint plan for a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Mr. President, you were a school superintendent. I was. Yes, I'm sir. not an educator, but I was, I was an accidental superintendent. Okay. We, let's close with this subject. All over the country since the Newtown, Connecticut uh, shootings, um, people, in addition to the issue of gun control, are asking the questions. The question, how can we make our schools safer? And there are all kinds of proposed uh, answers to that question, ranging from arming our teachers to having school resource officers in every school, reconfiguring our schools for better cameras, whatever. Let's start with you as a former superintendent. I wish we could pass a law against crazy. I really wish we could, but so far we haven't been able to. And what's happened in some of these tragic cases is a result of people who are truly unbalanced and crazy. Here's what we can do, and I've learned this from parents and teachers. Don't try to force a state-defined 
answer down on every school the same way. When I was a superintendent, I learned that uh, some parents uh, whose kids were in ramp schools, meaning every classroom open to the outside, they wanted to make sure that the school site, the campus was secure so that nobody could get on the campus without going through the front office and being checked out. And others said, you know, the really a the answer in our area is a school resource officer. Others had different kinds of concerns about uh, making sure that students were properly identified as they got on and off buses because we've had some bad incidents around the country uh, with school buses. I think the main thing is to make sure that our school districts have the flexibility and the obligation and the help to define a plan that's good for them and then let them literally go to the school advisory councils and involve parents in defining a plan that's good for that school. That's what we need to do, and I think that's what we're going to do. About 30 seconds left. Uh, if a plan came together that required some expenditure by the state to ensure school safety, would you be open to it? Well, I think we're always going to be open to find ways to make our schools more safe. Uh, obviously, you know, we have to factor in cost. Um, you know, we, we have a, a small margin here of, uh, of what we call a surplus, but frankly, it's not a lot of breathing room. Um, but I believe that the safety of our children should be a priority. And I, I cannot agree more with what former superintendent, now uh, you know, president of the Senate, Don Gates, had to say, and that is that you know, one size fits all solution probably won't work here. But we should be looking for creative ways to make sure that we are protecting our kids. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, it's been a delight. We'll see you again in a few weeks.